absolute night of tragedy here at the Leather Park in Old Sydney. I can hear screams everywhere. The fire started with the ghost train. That's the last time I saw my four friends. The four boys were among seven people incinerated. I saw shooting flames that weren't at all. They came to the house, two young detectives. I was in this. The police covered it up. That fire was deliberately lit. What do you think caused this fire? Arson. 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 The investigation was rigged. It's corruption. Well, that's murder. That's murder. It's time for the truth. It's never too late. To dear Richard, before you read this letter, please make sure that nobody is in the room. Ever since I saw you, I thought you were so cute and handsome. Maybe one day you shall find out who wrote this letter. But until then, I want you to know that I'm a girl who is crazy over you. Love, your admirer. Kiss, kiss. Richard Carroll was like the model material, so the girls loved him. He was just a really good looking dude. Liked the girls, and the girls liked him. <laughs> Love the girls. <laughs> Love those girls, they did, those boys. We've been speaking about girls. I, I believe Richard had said he'd maybe kissed a girl. And they just were very sort of drawn to his magnetic personality. We had a, a memorial service for him at Rose Bay, for him, just him alone. I remember being at the church and I saw the little girls that were the boys' girlfriends. They were terribly, terribly upset. So did they stand out, did they? Oh yes, they stood out. Oh, heaven just... So their behaviour and their emotion was... Oh, over the top. Over the top. In fact, almost to a hysterical stage, I'd say. They sat on one side of the whole church, right at the very back, and, and as far back as they could be, near the door, to go out. They didn't want to be seen. Many years later, I decided that that was a very unusual sort of situation. And I thought maybe, just maybe, those girls were supposed to meet up with the boys. On the night, there were some girls that were supposed to come with us. I do remember him saying there, there were possibilities that could happen. I do remember that conversation. Are those girls coming? I, I remember hearing that. We were meeting up with some girls. Did we ever meet up with those girls? No. So when did the penny drop as to who these girls were? I'd learnt later. I got a phone call from one of the girls much, much later on. Just out of the blue. Yeah, just out of the blue. It would have been about 9, 9.30 at night. But she was one of the girls I saw so distressed in the back of the church. But she was obviously quite distressed when she rang me. Distressed, anxious almost wanting to tell me or say, forgive me. That was the feeling I got. I was very distressed for her. I said, what is it? You're troubled about something. And she was trying to get her words out. And she said, we were going to Luna Park with the boys and we were stopped. And she said, my dad told everyone we couldn't go. There was something happening at Luna Park that he, that he was scared for the girls to go. The father would definitely stop them going. Did she tell you why he stopped them? 
She said something about something going down bad at Luna Park. She asked me not to say something about it. That sort of got me a little bit anxious. And then when I put two and two together, I thought to myself, well, I could understand why, because she doesn't want to put her father's name maybe out there. And that worried me enormously because he was... Um, not a very particularly nice man. Can you tell me the name? Um, Jack, Jack Hookland, yeah. Jack Rooklyn, the cigar-smoking poker machine operator and ocean racing identity. He also had links with American organised crime. The Genovese crime family, considered the most powerful mafia group in the United States. Mr Rooklyn has been named in two royal commissions as an associate of organised crime. It was a source of some interest that Jack Rooklyn had offered Knight a job. The policeman in charge of the investigation, Detective Inspector Doug Knight. Man heading the investigation, Detective Inspector Knight. The officer in charge of the inquiry, Detective Inspector Douglas Knight, spoke to reporters about the fire. Inspector, what about your investigations as to cause? Have you come to any conclusion? We're now satisfied that the fire was as a result of an electrical fault within the building. My name is Richard Dixon. I was a former police officer in the Commonwealth Police and the Federal Police. Doug Knight was a dodgy policeman, a dodgy detective. What if I told you Doug Knight was the lead investigator on the Ghost Train fire investigation? Uh, I'm surprised that Doug Knight was given that uh, job. Doug Knight was not a suitable person to have done this inquiry. Yet there he is. Yeah. On site. I had no idea that he was in charge of this, that Doug Knight was any way involved in this matter. What do you know of Detective Inspector Doug Knight? Yeah. Uh, oh, I'd rather not say you that. Detective Inspector Doug Knight is dead. Come on, Cole. Well, let me say... I'll try to put this as good as I can put it without putting myself in a lot of strife, but, you know, fix up. Is that all right? What's a fixer? Sort things out for the right people and spend a lot of his time, you know, of fixing results of court cases. Wayne Evans. I was formerly a police prosecutor. There were certain police in the force that were known as fixers or quid men. And they could organise results that wouldn't otherwise be achieved. Tell me all about Doug Knight. A quid man. That means he was able to fix things. And who would Doug Knight fix things for? I mean, was he fixing things for the families who are seeking justice? No. No, the baddies. The people who had most to lose. How would he do that? By deleting evidence in places and changing evidence in places. Change this, alter that. So Doug Knight would delete evidence, change evidence, alter evidence. And that's what we found in our investigation. He falsely claimed that the fire was caused by an electrical fault and he wiped the entire crime scene. They've erased a crime scene in a very quick and orderly fashion. And no one has said anything about it. Every bit of evidence that could exist is gone. 
No proof. Then that's not an electrical fault. Never has been. When I hear the name at night, I immediately start to wonder where something could have been possibly withheld or changed. Don't see this. Forget you saw that. It might be that witnesses were intimidated. Like, I felt like I was intimidated. They hounded like I was being pressured. If you don't change your statement, something's going to happen. She said that the police had told her that they could not prove that bikies had lit the fire and that she should forget it. Now, there were a lot of bikies there. I smelt kerosene burning. Burning kerosene. I told the police that and no one's very interested. Nothing came out of it. No one wanted to know who we were, as in the police. I think I was just fucked off. We've all been silenced. So are we looking at a corrupt police officer? Yes, you are. I can say that now. Why the hell was Doug Knight involved in that in the first place? Well, hang on, was he put there for a purpose? To get the dishonest result? It means that there were corrupt elements at a higher level within the police force, corrupt policemen above him. So the policeman above Doug Knight, who was overseeing the Lunar Park fire investigation, is listed here in these police logs, and Assistant Commissioner Black, that's Jim Black, who's now passed away. Now, Jim Black was on scene that morning with Doug Knight, hands on, issuing orders. Oh, dear. I've seen that face before. It's not a face I want to see. <laughs> Yeah, Assistant Commissioner Black, Crook as Rookwood, <laughs> yeah. What does Crook as Rookwood mean? He's not to be trifled with and we would finish up, you know, in the cemetery if he did. OK, I found some more information about Jim Black. So this is a confidential police intelligence file from 1981, so two years after the fire. And it says that Jim Black was allegedly being paid off by Jack Rooklyn. And look who else was allegedly being paid off by Rooklyn. Inspector Doug Knight was being paid off by Jack Rooklyn. Jim Black was being paid off by Jack Rooklyn. And there's a third name here, a third police officer. He was also on site the morning after the fire at Luna Park. There was someone else on scene that caught our eye yeah. in the archive. And we'll paused on the vision. In the, which one? White shirt and the tie and the grey suit. You recognise him? Oh, Jesus, no. Don't tell me. <laughs> Is he mixed up in this? Bill Allen's career as a top copper took off in 1979. The most corrupt police officer in any police force in the whole of this world. Deputy Police Commissioner Bill Allen has been found guilty of bribing a junior officer. He's dishonest. He's been proven to be a thief. He was involved in bribes. Deputy Commissioner Bill Allen was involved in the setting up of a protection racket. There was no one ever more corrupt than him. I could tell you stories about him that would shake into your boots. Bill Allen, once among the state's highest ranking police officers, walked into court this afternoon facing a possible jail sentence. How would you describe Bill Allen? Shonk. A great shonk, Bill Allen. He is a bad, bad person, believe me. Capable of anything. And I mean anything. That's him arriving that morning just after the fire. That's him on site. Jesus. So we have the detective in charge, Doug Knight, is corrupt? Yes. We have Bill Allen. Corrupt also. This is getting worse. Gee, bloody dear. So to you, John, is it possible 
that Bill Allen and Doug Knight were doing a job on the Lunar Park. Yes. The answer is yes. Yes. Without hesitation. Well, they were people of ill repute, policemen of ill repute. So yeah. now we've got Doug Knight, Jim Black, Bill Allen allegedly receiving payment from Jack Rooklyn. Yep. Brings all these people together into one criminal conspiracy. So what's this looking like, these three men here together on this investigation? Oh, club effort. To me it does. Specifically to keep something hidden. If you imagine that was someone's purpose, to light it up, to deliberately burn it, to destroy the park, to stop it, to make it ineffective, to make it useless, and to make room for something else. So the business rationale behind the possibility of arson would be? Oh, to take it over. Because that's where money is made, in the redevelopment of the site. My name is Ganya McCaffrey and I was spokesperson for Friends of Luna Park. In 95 I became the Mayor of North Sydney and I was on the Luna Park Trust. People have just got to put the pressure on the government and say hands off public land. How attractive was the land to developers? Extremely attractive. It's a large parcel of foreshore land next to the Harbour Bridge, opposite the Opera House and opposite the CBD. And it's undeveloped. You and I see oh, a beautiful amusement park. A developer sees undeveloped land. On the future of Sydney's Lunar Park, the government has called tenders for redevelopment of the site. Tenders weren't closed for several weeks yet, but already there are fears that the funfair, in its traditional form, will disappear. Lunar Park's crown land, which means it's land that's owned by the state government, essentially, and the government decides what sort of lease it's going to give you. This stack of binders contains previously confidential documents about the Lunar Park tender, and I've dug it up at State Archives. This report shows that come November 1979, there was one standout bid in the government's eyes. Now, it was backed and financed by the respected media and entertainment company, the Grundy Corporation, and their bid was called Kamingo. There it is. Kamingo Proprietary Limited. This proposal is by far the best financially, practically and conceptually. So what's that suggesting in terms of Kamingo? The Reg Grundy Company had the lease. Barry Weston from the Grundy organisation. What happened to their tender? Hello. Hi, is that Barry Weston? Yes. The Grundy organisation was one of several companies or, or groups that tended to win the lease for Luna Park. Correct. It looked like you were going to win. We were going to win. I went to the States and we had all new rides and all sorts of stuff all lined up to come out and everything. Our tender was brilliant. We were the top bid, we were told. And when did you start to sense that things may have been going wrong? Well, I think right down to the very final day when we thought we had it all the way to the end. We were very confident. And then all of a sudden it just fell apart. The Grundy organisation had just about the whole Lunar Park site tied up with its plan and that was sharply knocked on their head and new tenders were called. The government recently decided to call fresh tenders for the lease of the park. Who did the government choose? Shock plan to update Lena Park. A surprise new contender has beaten the field of developers with the right to modernise Lena Park. The new lease will be formally signed by Harbourside Amusements. The new proprietors of this land is a company called Harbourside Amusements. 
I suppose to maintain the place. Did they do that? No, not at all. No. Lula Park, just for fun. Fantasy land of our childhood. An institution with a fascinating history is to be broken up. Well, they did very quickly thereafter. Was, um, they auctioned off a lot of its best material. About 1,300 items. Under the hammer will go 45 years of our folklore. One of the finest collections of amusement art in this country will be sold off. Do you remember that auction? I do. It was just a farce. Virtually destroy the foundations of it. And it'll be going back to the United States. Then you take away all the little elements of it. That $120, $120 all done. It's gone at $120. You know, the carousels. The highest price of the day went for the carousel that's been a feature of the park since it opened in 1935. Things that had historical significance or had meaning, they're gone. More than mere memorabilia, a complete history. Lunar Park is vanishing before our eyes at this very moment. Sydney artist Martin Sharp of the Friends of Lunar Park group was at the auction to witness what he had fought against for so long. How did you feel? Well, it's um, Lunar Park's funeral. God, how did they let that happen? It's outrageous. <laughs> The auction ends late tomorrow. Lunar Park will have been stripped clean. What everyone didn't know at the time was who were the people involved and how they achieved what they did. That fire was an act of terrorism. Again, the development over that site. And people have swept it under the carpet and forgotten about it. For various reasons. But the main reason is they're scared. Because why has this man who has been so powerful in crime never been touched? I get blamed for so many things and it's horrible that this should happen. But why? Why do you get blamed for so many things? Yes, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe you could tell me you haven't met me till today. What was your first impressions when you came to meet me? Well, I was interested to meet you because I've known of you as Mr. Sin. He's Abraham Gilbert Saffron. Big time crook, mafia associate. Mr. Sin of Sydney. He was very sensitive about being called Mr. Sin. Do you accept that title? I certainly do not, and I consider myself, in business, a most honourable person. Abe Saffron ran some of the most notorious bars, nightclubs and strip joints in the cross. He was the king of the cross. That, that, that was the centre of his operations. This is Sydney's King's Cross home of spruikers and hookers, coppers and strippers, where flash meets flesh. And everywhere it's sex, sex, sex. And of course it wouldn't be the cross without the gangsters. Crime, fraud, drugs, prostitution. Live show inside, naked girls, they're all getting it off in here. His prostitution empire was said to be vast, but he's never been prosecuted for keeping premises for the purposes of prostitution. I can say now that I have no criminal activities whatsoever in any way, shape or form. Saffron would have been investigated time and time again by police. And so they didn't lay a glove on him. Mr. Abe Saffron, had allegedly paid millions of dollars in bribes to police officers. Corruption of police officers on a massive scale throughout a 12-year period. So he corrupted the police? Yes. He would pay them. So was that his power? Yes. Yes. He'd bought the police? Yes. Did you make them an offer they couldn't refuse? <laughs> so the tentacles of crime reached? Everywhere. So what does that say? about the state of the justice system then? It's terrible to say, but it was a joke. 
And that was the term that was used. Are they in on the joke? <laughs> Saffron's tactics were blackmail, extortion, bribery. And arson? Abe Saffron, who is a very dark figure in the entertainment business in Australia, is a well known person, the use of fire for real estate purposes. My name's Rod Lynch, and at the time of the investigation of the fires, I would have been a detective sergeant, second class. Abe Saffron, did he use arson as a particular tool? I only know about these matters that I investigated, and based on the evidence, he did use it as a tool. Let's rewind the clock back in the early 80s. Well, there were a series of fires in King's Cross and Eastern Suburbs. All this is what's left of 85 Oxford Street. It was a gay disco and a highly successful one. David, was it arson? Most certainly it was arson. The police tell me that they found two drums that had contained kerosene. Kerosene had started the fire. One after the other, we're getting burnt out. So what was the thought then when these fires were happening? Where were they? The Peak Restaurant. The Peak, which was an establishment for ladies only, it was burnt out. It was indeed, yes. Was that arson? Yes, I would say, so definitely arson. It was kerosene all over the place. The Wonder Centre, King's Cross. Fonzie's Fantasy Land. The Venus Room, King's Cross. 148 Brighton Boulevard, North Bondi. The Anglers Club. The Creole Disco. If any of you guys were prepared to point the finger at the people that you believe did this and the other fires, what would happen? Oh, uh, we here. We'd have the, you know, our heads um, mm -hmm. done into the sea, you know. There's yeah. no, there's no buts or what's about it. Is it that heavy a scene? Yes. These fires, because of their number, and the commonalities, they became suspicious. What did they have in common? What was suspicious about them? Abe Saffron. Of the six fires, Mr Saffron had a financial interest in five of the locations. Arson was performed for personal gain, quite clearly. I mean, how confident were you that it was arson? Oh, there was no doubt in my mind, as an investigator, that because it was arson, the coroner found Abraham Gilbert Saffron was responsible for these fires with evidence supporting that to a sufficient degree to place him before the court. And did that happen? No, it didn't go any further. Hello? Hi, I'm after Peter who used to be a police prosecutor. That's me. Assisting the coroner. I'm ringing about an investigation into a spate of fires. Oh, yes. I remember the, the fire incidents quite well, actually. I yep. often thought there was a lot more to it than we ever got onto, though. Everything there was stonewalled. I don't want to show my face. I feel concerned about retributions. We had a number of problems that came out of some of the cases I did. There were some death threats. So who is this man in relation to what you investigated? I think he's the master bullet. I mean, looking back on it now, is this sort of a, the one that got away? Oh, yeah. I'd say so. I've never seen a better example of highly organised crime in my life. Be as candid as you can and tell us what do you think really happened behind the scenes with all of these fires investigations? What do I think happened? Too big and too powerful to, for anybody to touch. Saffron had a lot of police in his pocket. People in very big, powerful positions who were corrupt, all the way up to scale to politicians. Was that what you were up against? Yeah, I think so. Uh, how 
do you stop a monster like that? All the rumours that we all heard was that, that uh, Abe Saffron was involved in the park. That's what we heard. But none of us ever had any evidence. Did you or do you have any connection directly or indirectly with the Lunar Park site? None at all. Did no. you try to hide your connection? I've got no idea who said it, but it's untrue. He was a clever operator. Abe Saffron had these people covering for him in the site to keep his name largely out of it. Saffron's name's always been connected behind the scenes. He's always wanted to learn his art. All right, for years. He is now in control of Lunar Park through his cousins, Alan Cole Goldstein, who, with no previous experience in fun affairs, won the lease from the government. They obtained it through criminal men. Goldstein was the one who did all the work there. Cole Goldstein. The state government has announced there'll be a special investigation to find out if there are any links between Sydney businessman Abe Saffron and the operators of Lunar Park. The matters to be covered by the Commission's special investigation include whether Mr Saffron gained any financial benefit or other interest or advantage through the dealing of Harborside Amusement Park Proprietary Limited. The New South Wales Corporate Affairs Commission looked into this. Have you read that report? No. You've seen it? I haven't seen this. Yep. So there's a family relationship. And there is a social relationship. There is a business relationship between Mr. Coleman Goldstein and Abraham Saffron. Oh, they looked as a clear association. I'd say Abe's got his fingers well and truly into Luna Park at this stage. Here's some more information for you. Ah, Mr. Cowper becomes the financial controller and company secretary of Harborside. But you see, this is what's really creepy. This guy's his nephew. He's also on a trust that manages all Abe's money. And he's the financial controller at Luna Park. Ah, oh, dear, it makes you feel sick, doesn't it? Anyway, like, it stinks to high heavens. Abe Saffron has his cousins and his nephew running the company that won control of Luna Park after the fire. But Saffron's links don't end there. He also manages to install 100 of his own Arcadia game machines into Luna Park, and the cash from those machines flows directly into Saffron's own personal trust. I mean, it's all... It's... Oh, it's What questions do you have for the government? Well, I mean, did the government know that Abe Saffron was involved in the park? My name's Sandra Andersons, and I was on the Lunar Park Tender Assessment Committee for the state government after the 79 fire. And do you know, out of those on the Tender Assessment Committee, who's still alive? No, I don't. Just you? Yes, <laughs> it's... <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> you're the last one standing. Last one standing, right. This is some material from the New South Wales Corporate Affairs Commission, which went on to investigate the company that you and the Tender Assessment mm -hmm. Committee awarded the lease to. Mm -hmm. What's going through your brain? Well, it was obviously a, a dodgy group. Did you know that at the time? No. And I feel duped. Had people known, you wouldn't have awarded the contract to uh, company with criminal connections. Do you acknowledge it was a mistake? Yeah. 
It should have been a more rigorous process. It's pathetic. Mm -hmm. And with hindsight, I'm increasingly of the view it's about the land. It's about getting hold of the land, getting your foot in the door by pretending you're a park operator. I think the whole thing was a shroud. Before the New South Wales Corporate Affairs Commission had finished its investigation, behind the scenes, the New South Wales Police Licensing Squad had actually run its own inquiry into Harborside and Abe Saffron. Its report was never released publicly, but I've managed to get a copy. This really hasn't seen the light of day. My goodness. At the time, licensing were a very uh, significant investigative force. And for them to say that there appears to be a determined effort to hide the true family and business involvement of Saffron in this company. I mean, you cannot let that lie. It has to be taken further. There's, there's plenty of evidence there. The licensing report concludes with this in April 1986. It says, if the matters contained in this report are found to support a strong inference of Saffron ownership or involvement in this company, then the question of the Lunar Park fire needs, I feel, to be addressed from a different perspective. The question is, are any of these officers still alive? This one is Steve Bullock. Steve Bullock, I, I certainly do stand by the report and all its contents. Um, I uh, it, it took, it took a lot of hard work to do it and uh, it's a factual report and everything in it is uh, bona fide. And what... Absolutely, to the hilt. And, and what did you find? Where did you reach as to the possibility of Abe Saffron's involvement in this well, fire? Well, I'm 100% sure. I believe that he instigated the fire. So to be clear, you believe Abe Saffron was absolutely behind that ghost train fire? I certainly do. I certainly do. Did other people in police agree with you or believe yes. that? Yes. You weren't the only one? No, no. Mm. I didn't do the, the report for nothing. My name is James Lowen Swanson. At the time of the report, I was a licensing magistrate in the state of New South Wales. Have you ever spoken publicly before about this report and this investigation? No. What's brought you here today to talk about it? Justice has not been done, particularly to the people concerned in the fire. Did these licensing investigators, did they get it right? Yes, I think they did, yes. Do you too believe that Abe Saffron could be behind that fire at Luna Park? Yes, yes. Do you think Abe Saffron got away with it? Yes. When the report was finished, it was sent up to senior police. And what happened? Nothing. They never did anything with it. Should something have happened? Yes, certainly. How do you account for the police not doing anything with it? Because the police, the senior police and the senior ministers are all corrupt. And, and you know, some of them are very corrupt, yep. That's a big thing to say. I know. It's a big thing to say, I know. And uh, because of corruption by those people, the report did not go any further than what it was. Basically, the New South Wales licensing squad found strong and even disturbing links between Abe Saffron and the company that won Luna Park after the fire, recommending further investigation. But a year later, this is what the New South Wales Corporate Affairs Commission found. Oh, my God. There is no evidence available. There is no evidence available to the delegates. <laughs> that suggests Abraham Saffron. There's any actual or beneficial ownership in Harborside. It's pathetic. I don't agree with it. I don't agree with it at all. This is quite extraordinary. This is called the whitewash. Such a whitewash. Have you found any of the report authors? They certainly have a lot of questions to answer. 
Have you ever spoken publicly about your role in these, in the Abe Saffron investigations and those no. crown investigations? I'm just going to run you through a series of responses, people who are critical of that CAC report. Sure. Okay. It's a whitewash, that New South Wales CAC report, a whitewash. Another described it as pathetic. And another says Saffron certainly had an interest in the park. Are they all wrong? Well, I think... Um... I don't think that uh, those criticisms are justified. I don't think it was a whitewash. But yes, I think it was a missed opportunity. And um, we didn't bring home the bacon. Yeah. Abe Saffron get his outsmarted you all? Perhaps he did outsmart us. Perhaps they all did. Um, I've got away with a lot for a long time. I'm Michael Gerundis, retired detective inspector, New South Wales Police. I was working at Threadburn in 1982, in the winter of 1982. A friend of mine and I went fishing and on the way back we stopped at the Anaminabee pub to get a pie. So I went in, and there was only half a dozen people in the pub. And in the corner of the pub were three men. They're all sitting very close in the corner of the bar having a beer in deep conversation over business. In a small out of the way pub where you would expect no one to see. And as soon as I saw them, I bolted. Straight back out to the car and said, forget the pie, we're out of here scared the shit out of me. So who were they then? Bill Allen, the assistant commissioner of police with another fellow there and, and Abe Saffron, the king of the underworld. I didn't smell very good. What did you think of that sighting? You had the assistant commissioner of police with... Scared the crap out of me. Mr Sin having it a was, It was awful. Yep. Bill Allen was a mate of Saffron. My name's Rosemary, and I was in Abe Saffron's inner circle for approximately 40 years. Have you ever spoken publicly and told your story about your association with Abe Saffron and all these people from the past? No. Abe Saffron loved to entertain. Friday night drinks, it was almost like Hernando's hideaway. What sort of people were at these Friday night drinks with Abe Saffron? They were top of the town people, up in the higher echelon. How high did they go? I'd say to the top. He had policemen, he had politicians. There was a commissioner of police that came to the house. And I know that because I served him drinks. Who was that Commissioner of Police? Allen. Bill Allen? Yes. You saw Bill Allen being entertained by Abe Saffron? Mm-hmm. With your own eyes? Mm-hmm. Are you surprised? Yes. I thought, what the hell's he doing? He's supposed to be the Commissioner of Police. about this man? Oh, yeah. I went to his place, Jack Rooklyn. Did you see Jack Rooklyn and Abe Saffron together? Oh, of course. They were good buddies. Really good buddies. Abe Saffron and Jack Rooklyn were, in fact, um, associates. And she said, my dad told everyone we couldn't go. There was something happening at Luna Park, something going down bad. 
Can you tell me the name? Jack. Jack Rookland, yeah. There's a connection between Jack Rookland and Abe Saffron, and if you connect Doug Knight to Jack Rookland, it's an even stronger connection. Jack Rookland pays money to Bill Allen. You got Bill Allen mixed up with Abe Saffron. The arrows are pointing to the, the, the connection between the senior police and the criminals. A huge web of criminal endeavour by a, a lot of police. It's clearly the pattern of a cover-up uh, and clearly is corrupt. On behalf of whom? A cover-up on behalf of whom? Those that arrange and cause the fire. This is what Martin was on about, Martin Sharp. People died. Yeah. Kids, little kids. Martin Sharp was very angry and very frustrated. He's like a prophet in the wilderness, you know, in so many ways. He was trying to get people to pay attention to it. I've never had anyone that showed the passion and the interest in wanting to find out what happened to those seven people that night. And Martin, well, he's an eccentric artist with an obsession. Martin Sharp's other great obsession is Luna Park, a tragic ghost train fire in 1979. Are you obsessed with this Luna Park fire? I am obsessed, if you like, in the fact that I don't think justice has been done in this matter. Martin believes something underhanded had happened. The ones that we trust, our politicians, our police, Exactly, that's, that's Martin's theory, and it's not a bad one. Uh, I think it's, it's a very, very plausible theory. Martin Sharp, who has reconstructed the night of the fire from eyewitness reports, believes a fresh inquiry is justified. Your tickets for the creepiest, spine-tingling ride of your life on the ghost train. A lot of people in the park today who were here that night, and they're feeling very bad about it because they were all told to shut up, and there was rumours of five bikies came in here again. Torch the place. It was set on uh, for a gang of bikies who were commissioned to do it. Perpetrators were commissioned by Abe Saffron. to the city, the National Crime Authority. It's like the FBI or something. It was a bit of a star chamber, actually. It was like waking up in a little car rain novel. One of them let it slip that they were investigating that possibly the same Viking groups that were involved in, in another incident in Sydney were uh, involved in this. I was shown some photos photos of, of people they believed were at the park at the, on that night. Photos of guys with long hair. We know from our own investigation that multiple eyewitnesses did see bikies there that night. Several have told us that they believed those people lit the fire and that they told police that at the time. They were witnessed by, not just me, they were witnessed by quite a few of us. The moment he turned around, he said, Harrison matches, and we were looking at these people. Hair. Shoulder length, blonde hair. Bikies go into the ride. She had reported that bikies had emerged from the ghost train. There was a bikie with a very long beard. She described them as long haired, bearded, and drinking cans of beer. He had a can of beer in his hand. And there were a lot of bikies there, and the fire happened with these bikers that were of cause. Hey. There was this guy there. A couple of biking bikes, they got away that night. Despite all the sightings and the detailed descriptions by witnesses at the time, the National Crime Authority found no evidence that bikies lit the fire. But it did confirm that a group of bikies rode the ghost train just minutes before the fire began, and the police just let that trail go cold. 
The NCA concluded that six years after the fire, when it started investigating, after such a lapse of time, there was virtually no chance of ever finding those bikies. It was six years enough time to completely kill something. I can't see. I can't see that anything would be lost in six years. There wasn't enough evidence. It was a bit of the same as the inquest. To me, it was just another inquiry. And nothing really happened. Yeah. Closed door. I just mourned for our son. That was... Yep. And came up with nothing. The record needs to be set straight. The NCA report is deficient in a number of areas. Have you ever spoken publicly about your role in this investigation, the NCA report? No, no, never. I started working on the investigation and then I left. Now, I wasn't there at the end, knowing all the allegations. And the allegations were there right from the very beginning that Saffron was involved. So, I mean, the minute you hear those allegations, your radar should go up and that's one of the things you'd look at and say, is somebody interfering in the investigation? The NCA was specifically meant to look at the possibility of police corruption. We found that three senior police officers who were either running the investigation or were on scene that morning were corrupt. 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 Crook as Rookwood. The NCA found that the police investigation was grossly inadequate and that proper procedures were abandoned at a very early stage in the investigation. Yet when it came to answering why the police investigation was so grossly inadequate, the NCA report spends just 17 words, one sentence, on the possibility of police corruption. There is no evidence that the inadequacy of the police investigation was due to dishonesty or corruption. I, I just, the mind boggles now because I'm just uh, grabbing at straws. We cannot make sense of this. No. no. I can't. The NCA also failed to properly examine something else. Abe Saffron's interest in acquiring Luna Park, writing that there was no evidence that Saffron was attempting to obtain the lease. But it looks like the NCA was wrong. This morning, the Melbourne Age newspaper filled its front page with a dramatic story based on what's claimed to be secret police phone taps in both tape and transcript form. The tapes are of conversations illegally recorded by the New South Wales Police. The judge mentioned so prominently in what has become known as the Age tapes is a member of the High Court, Mr Justice Lionel Murphy. Lionel Murphy, he was a High Court judge. That's the top top of the legal system. The tapes exposed a network of organised crime and corruption. And the Justice Lionel Murphy had made improper overtures on behalf of a Sydney solicitor, Mr Morgan Ryan. Morgan Ryan was a representative for Abe Saffron in many things. Morgan Ryan, the Sydney solicitor, police have called Mr Fix. It was Mr Ryan's telephone that police illegally tapped. The Parliamentary Commission will be the sixth formal investigation into Mr Justice Murphy's conduct as a result of the age tapes. My name is Andrew Phelan and I was appointed to conduct and coordinate all of the investigations by the Parliamentary Commission into the conduct of Justice Lionel Murphy. What were the allegations? What was Lionel Murphy up to? Relationships with certain people. People who one would expect a judge not to have relationships with. Who were they? Well, uh, Saffron, uh, Abe Saffron. Allegations that High Court Judge Lionel Murphy once met Sydney businessman Abe Saffron were made on the eve of the new inquiry. Today, Murphy made it clear what he thought of the claims. Disgraceful, and I don't propose to make any other comment. Think it was a deliberate... Murphy denied knowing Saffron. Yes, well, that's not true. That's not true. It's a lie, because I saw them together. 
They definitely knew each other. I did see Abe Saffron and Lionel Murphy together. 100%. 100%. And where would you see them together? The house. And Lodge 44. Lodge 44 at Edgecliff in Sydney. This rather insignificant motel in Sydney's eastern suburbs might be the hub of a criminal empire. So all of these things were happening behind closed doors. Oh, yeah. Very closed doors. How appropriate is it for a High Court judge, Lionel Murphy, to be having drinks and these private meetings with a crime boss, Abe Saffron? Not good at all. As the inquiry continued, and you were digging and digging, what sort of picture emerged about Lionel Murphy? We'd reached the stage where we were satisfied that there were 15 allegations that should have been brought forward to a hearing. And what happened? His honour was gravely ill, terminally ill, and he had very few months or weeks to live. Tonight, Lionel Murphy, former Attorney General and Australia's most controversial jurist, is dead. Did his death kill the inquiry? Exactly, of course it did, yes. And the whole thing was just shut down. But my view firmly is that the matters should not have died with the cessation of the Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry. This was dealing with matters of national significance. When Lionel Murphy died, all of the evidence and testimony about what he was allegedly up to was locked up by the government for 30 years. Buried among those thousands of pages is allegation number 27. Allegation number 27. The Honourable Lionel Keith Murphy, in or about the early months of 1980, and whilst the Justice of the High Court of Australia agreed with Morgan Ryan that he, the judge, would make representations on behalf of the company associated with Abraham Gilbert Saffron. Oh, my goodness. To the Honourable Neville Rann, then the Premier of New South Wales. He's the Premier. Neville Rann is the state's longest serving Premier, a testament to his endurance as well as his political acumen. That's the top of the state. What was the relationship between Neville Rann and Lionel Murphy? They were close friends of, for many years. Lionel Murphy is probably my closest friend. People may think, you know, that I'm a little biased his way. So what's the allegation number 27? Neville Rann and Lionel Murphy colluded to obtain a lease for Abe Saffron of the premises known as Luna Park. That's in the aftermath of the fire. A High Court judge conspiring with a mobster's associate and the Premier of the state to swing a lucrative piece of Crown land to the mobster. Yes, the intervention was at the level of the Premier of the state. Oh, it's extremely serious. On a scale of seriousness, one to 10, where does that sit? It's very high, 10. This is what makes Allegation 27 so serious. It's the information that backs it all up. It's confidential testimony given under oath in the mid-1980s by three senior police officers who actually worked on the telephone intercepts. I'd like to show you now a document that has now been released after being under seal right. for 30 years in confidence. You'll see here the first is evidence given by a sergeant. Former Sergeant MK Og. Good policeman, Mick Og. Og, the type transcripts of the intercepted telephone conversations of Ryan. There's another, and that's a Sergeant Trahan. He said he'd listened to tapes. The other witness who said that he recalled the matter was Mr Egg. A Sergeant P.L. Egg. Yeah. He read a transcript about this conversation. Yes. It did occur. Yes. He certainly is saying that, and he's quite strong on that. It's something to pursue. Of course it was. They're not nobodies, they're all sergeants. So why the hell hasn't it been followed up? It's not good. So what do we need to do? You need to find Mr Egg, or Sergeant Egg. Has he left the police force?
My name's Paul Egg, and I'm a retired detective senior sergeant. Have you ever spoken publicly or given an interview about your work on this matter? No. A long-held silence? Yes, yeah. yep. There were very high criminals. We're dealing with the Premier or the judge or both. The Premier was corrupted. The Premier was in touch. He was involved, yes, big time. Uh, they, first of all, As an analyst, I would analyse what was relevant out of the phone conversations, do a relevant transcript, put it in a folder. In the transcripts, I read all about the fire at Luna Park and also the request by Abe Saffron at the last minute for the lease of the new development of Luna Park. It, there was transcript made of it and they were in that file. The proof right in the transcripts that I had. They were very valuable. And what happened to those transcripts of all those conversations? The transcripts were shredded. They were shredded while I wasn't there. Who shredded them? At the public service office school at the direction of uh, our new superintendent. So all of that evidence was destroyed? Yeah. <laughs> I was breathless. It should never have ever, ever have been destroyed. Why do you think they were shredded? Because there was corruption around. And with that shredding, what was lost? That Abe Saffron wanted the lease. That's the evidence and uh, it was their conversation. We didn't make it up. So, Paul, yeah. you yourself yep. and Robert Trahan yeah. and Michael Ogg, three officers, all gave evidence under oath yeah. that they have a recollection of a conversation between Abe Saffron and others organising yeah. to get the Luna yeah. Park lease. Do you think there could be others? Yes, yes. My name is Roger Kilburn. I was one of the police officers conducting telephone interceptions on Morgan Ryan and Lionel Murphy. Have you ever spoken publicly before? No, I have not. I was a senior constable in the technical support unit. We spent many hours sitting there typing up those transcripts from reel to reel tape recorders, starting, stopping, listening so we could understand what uh, was being said. I'm very certain that I heard a conversation about the Luna Park lease between Morgan Ryan and Lionel Murphy during the time that I was working at the TSU. It was either directly or subsequently from the tape. What happened to the tapes? They were destroyed. We barbecued some. Took a whole bundle out in a small boat and dropped them overboard. Oh, two or three nautical miles off Sydney Heads. They're still there, I believe. Wow. Why did you have to destroy the tapes? Because uh, the Premier then, Neville Wren, came out with all guns blazing, uh, threatening to jail the uh, police officers that were involved. That was us, of course. Mr Rand said the police responsible should be jailed. Premier Neville Rand declared the tapes phony and attacked the media. But they can claim what they like. I'm telling you what the facts are. Is public action threatening us with jail uh, was terrifying and uh, it was then that we 
set about to destroy the tapes. Is it possible that you helped destroy the records of what we've been talking about today? I certainly did help to destroy those records, yes. And uh, I have to put on the record that uh, I'm so sorry that we did, because at least they'd still be here today and uh, perhaps could shed more light on your investigation. Did the National Crime Authority contact you or interview you? No. For its investigation into the Lunar Park fire? No. No. It's a serious omission, I think, on the part of the NCA. What would you have told the National Crime Authority if they had interviewed you about Abe Saffron's interest in Lunar Park? That Abe Saffron was definitely interested in the Lunar Park lease. How would you respond if the NCA concluded that there was no evidence to support well, that Abe Saffron? if I found that out, not right. It's incorrect. It can't be sustained that there's no evidence because there is. And you've got it here, in black and white, from the police officers. Yeah, he wanted the lease of Lunar Park. Saffron said, I want the lease. Do we have a problem with the NCA? Yes, I think there is a problem with it, yeah, yeah. I don't think we can say now or rely now that the NCA report, particularly in relation to the Lunar Park fire, is the definitive report as to what occurred. There are a number of avenues of investigation that could and should have been followed up, and they weren't. If the National Crime Authority did elect to take the matter of the lease further, what would the National Crime Authority would have, they would have been bound to investigate who? It never ran, yes, for sure. <laughs> the allegations against him, corruption by Neville Ran. If proven, that would have brought down the Premier. Exactly. Why would Neville Ran get involved in this? Why would Neville Ran take that call from Murphy and make sure that the lease swung over to Wave Saffron? There had to be something in it for Ran. Oh, God. That's Neville. Neville Ran. Did you see that man with Abe Saffron? I did. Friday night drinks. OK. And at those Friday night drinks, is that where, you know, Neville Ran would be or...? On occasion. You're very sure about that, aren't you? Very sure about that. How did they seem together? What can you remember? Very pally. Really pally. I guess looking back on them, if I hadn't been stupid, I would have realised that something wasn't quite kosher. Why would you be mixing? But uh, when you're in a, in a situation like that, you just see what you want to see. You, you look past things you don't want to look at. It's okay. terrible. Just terrible. The scenario really indicates that corruption uh, in this case went right to the top. It is a despicable indictment on the system of justice in the state of New South Wales. Justice didn't prevail. So who came out on top? Bad over good. Abe Saffron. Do you think Abe Saffron got away with that fire? Yes. No one's been charged. It's organised crime, it's beyond it 100%. Did other police officers share and know this? Well, I got it from other police officers. Abe Saffron got three blokes to start the fire, create the fire. Three what was known as Humpty Dumpties. That they to take a great fall should they, anyone get caught. They're the perpetrators. They're the ones who should be in jail. I have some additional information. 
Okay, the story goes like this. Wow, Caro, this is shit. I was introduced to a man who was in a bikey gang. He had some news that wouldn't want to divulge it over the phone because there was a good chance his phone was being tapped. That man then divulged to me face to face over a beer at a private barbecue that Abe Saffron gave the order to burn the place down, to burn Luna Park down. But the fire at Luna Park was an order given directly to the bikey gang. And that man told me this to my face. You can't get any closer to the furnace than that. Is there any way you could have misheard that conversation or misinterpreted? 100%, 100% not. I'm on my way to meet the man, a former bikey, who says Abe Saffron gave the order to torch Luna Park. Now, he's agreed to meet me at a hotel on the Gold Coast. Question is, will he show up? It's Caro. Yeah. We were meant to meet here at one o'clock today. Yeah, well, what do you want to know? Just put it straight to the door. Okay, the question to ask is this. Mm -hmm. Is that story true? To so you can confirm that information. Well, I told the story to deal with her, but I don't know. I don't tell the story unless it's all right. I mentioned it had a certain group of people involved with it. That it was Abe Saffron who was behind the fire. So is that what you heard too? They're not pretty close, but they're pretty close off the So I haven't got that part of the story wrong. No. Yeah, yeah. Pretty clear to what they're doing. Do you reckon he got away with it, Abe Saffron? <laughs> well, I ran the show. Abe ran the show. Everyone saw each other quick and the world was rejoicing when they could do what they want. So what should be done now? The relatives of those people that died. I think they deserve to know what happened, even if it is distasteful, and it is distasteful. Very, very much so. I'm at a loss to say any more than that. Not nice at all. Well, I guess you're probably wondering what we've found. Definitely have. The intention and the purpose of today is to share some of where we've got to in our investigation. Sure. And if it becomes too much or you're not interested, you can just tell me to stop. OK. Yeah. Thank you. We've interviewed now multiple judicial figures, uh, police insiders, detectives, worked our way through a lot of detailed material and they have come to the conclusion that this was a cover-up and a web of criminal endeavour. <sighs> Police were corrupt. Their strong belief then and now is that Abe Saffron was behind the fire, 100%. And they said that he got away with it. And the police intelligence was that he had three guys to do it. Those men have never been found. So those poor children, the family were were just murdered. Yeah. I don't, that's it. I don't think I can do much more. I don't think I can go any further. That's it.
that just breaks your heart. Essentially, the allegation is that the reason why it didn't go any further was because of corruption further up. There are a lot of powerful people in powerful places protecting Abe. Oh, my God. This is unbelievable. Now I'm getting angry. So it went right to the top, we're told. Yeah. How are you feeling, Tony? Um... I had no idea that, uh, that you would have uncovered this. My four friends, four 13 year old boys, murdered in a fun house, in a ghost train, in a, an amusement park. Smoke and mirrors. How do I feel about those four little boys? I cannot even begin to even say the words that how they didn't deserve to die like that. And the truth is there, and all these people that have known what's really happened. What should happen? Now, back to the coroner. But I'd expect that to be reopened. The coroner should look at it again. I would not see any reason why the inquest could not be reopened or set aside and another inquest held. You've got evidence that obviously was not available at the time. There's sufficient evidence to show that it was done deliberately. It shouldn't just go to sleep. It's a matter that ought to go to the Attorney-General. The matter, despite the length of time, does warrant investigation. I will support uh, an inquiry. This should be a Royal Commission. They should finally do the right thing. And the family should get the, finally get the apologies they deserve. Thank you, everybody. Maybe the rest of my journey can be a bit more peaceful. 